My name is Andrea Siedl, I'm the Executive Secretary of Population Europe, and it's my pleasure, of course, to welcome you also on behalf of our network Population Europe, and particularly of our partner institute, the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital. Uh, let me introduce first my fellow co-moderator, Nico van Nimwegen. He's the Secretary General of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population. Nico. Thanks, Andreas, and a very warm welcome indeed also on behalf of the IUSSP. It's a great pleasure again for us to collaborate once more with our good colleagues from Population Europe, and we're looking forward to a great uh, webinar. Yeah, let me, perhaps before we start, uh, share some technical information with you. Um, so please uh, use the Q&A function. You can use the Q&A function, uh, on this little button on the top of the, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, throughout the whole event, and Nico and I will always try to get your questions then immediately on the floor. So please use the Q&A function if you would like to address questions to us. And now, uh, Nico. Uh... <laughs> okay, it's a bit of a ping pong between Andreas and myself, so we're... We're not new at the game, but uh, sometimes the ball goes missing. Okay, so it's my honor now to introduce our keynote uh, speaker of the today, which is Wolfgang Lutz, which, uh, Lutz, which is a very easy job because he doesn't need any introduction at all, I think. But still, he is founding director of the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital and also professor of demography in Vienna. And Wolfgang will speak, as we all know, about his uh, latest book, The Advanced Introduction to Demography, and we will focus especially on theories, demographic theories. Wolfgang, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Greetings from Luxembourg Castle, which is the uh, home of Yaza outside uh, Vienna here. I'm trying to share my screen and I hope you can uh, see it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's minimize this window. So we are talking about mostly about demographic theories uh, today, which is the chapter two of this advanced introduction. Uh, don't ask me what this advanced means. Uh, this is the name of a series uh, by the Elga Publishing House. And uh, at the bottom of this uh, promotion flyer here, uh, they say that it is supposed to give uh, sort of the accessible and same time rigorous uh, uh, for uh, many, uh, fields in the social sciences, business and law. So it's not primarily for demographers, it is also for people from other disciplines uh, to get some sort of excitement about what are the newest uh, trends in our discipline. So of uh, today's uh, 20 minute introductory comments, uh, I will uh, first talk a little about what is a theory in demography, what should we be expecting, how is it different from a model or some, something else we are used to talk about. And then I mentioned this uh, three demographic theories that I uh, have described in the book, uh, but most of the time I will spend on the so-called theory of demographic metabolism because it, uh, it's not yet well known. And I try to explain uh, the important uh, power that it has. And actually one of the reviewers, I first had it as the, the third theory, but one of the reviewers said, this is really the, the mother of all demographic theories. Therefore demographic metabolism needs to be at the beginning. And that's why I, I, I changed the sequence in the book also. And at the end, I will talk a little about how these theories based on multidimensional demography make the discipline more relevant for the rest of the world, particularly with you to aging and sustainable development. So I think uh, whenever you write uh, an introduction, um, and uh, I should say that uh, the invitation from the publisher uh, came uh, about two years ago, and I was not keen on doing it. Uh, what motivated me was that we having at the University of Vienna, a new department of demography, uh, where we already started doctoral program. Now this fall, we started the English language master program in global demography. And I needed to produce some text for the introductory lecture anyhow. Uh, but I didn't think I had the time, but then uh, lockdown came and I had to cancel all my trips. Uh, so uh, this way I could find the time to actually uh, produce this little book. Uh, so we have to lean back where also when new students come and tell them what is demography. Well, there are many definitions of demography and actually the IOSSP website lists uh, several of them. 
But the one classic definition stands out, and this, by the way, was also for many decades the one that the IUSSP advertised. It's the scientific study of changing population size and structures. And it's important to note that structures is stated in the plural, referring to multiple structures. Also, the age structure is clearly very important and dominates much of demographic analysis. It's not the only structure that we are looking at. And in this view, I, in this book, I give a particular emphasis on multidimensional demography, meaning by age, sex, place of residence, education, labor force participation, ethnicity, or in the US, we like to have a race as a demographic characteristics. And you may ask yourself sort of what is the, what is a demographic characteristics? How far down do you go with specific characteristics? And here the influential uh, textbook by uh, Schweig and Siegel on the materials of demography brings a rather pragmatic uh, definition. They say that a demographic characteristic is something that has traditionally been collected in censuses. Uh, but you also find it in, in many surveys when there's a first box of demographics where they just ask these basic issues. And also when the media write about the, let's say the changing demographics of the American electorate, and they do not just mean the changing age structure, they mean the changing composition by education groups, professional groups, race, and so on, place of residence. So there is both in the history of demography as well as in the common use, clearly a broader understanding of this multidimensional uh, um, characteristic of populations. Another thing that I have to say right at the beginning is that the Greek word demos that makes our name together with graphene and register is clearly the population as an aggregate. So we are talking about changes at the macro level. Actually, in, in ancient Greek, there also is another word, idiotes, which is the individual. And actually the word idiot is derived from this as somebody who only cares about his own private business, uh, which is the opposite of demos. So sort of, if you care about the demos, then you look at the aggregate. And as this uh, famous uh, Coleman ship shows that indeed there is a constant interaction between the micro and the macro level. So the macro level outcomes on the right are really sort of summing up uh, micro level outcomes that again are influenced by macro and micro conditions. So what is a theory is the next question to ask. If you go to the Cambridge dictionary or any other dictionary, it gives you a very broad and vague statement of uh, some uh, well, some explanations of effect and more generally even some opinion or an explanation. Well, this is not enough for a scientific perspective. Uh, this loose uh, usage of the word theory we don't want to have in science. And much of the natural sciences, as well as increasingly also uh, social sciences, uh, really subscribe to the, uh, the, the concept that is called critical rationalism, uh, which is the philosophy of science approach uh, that uh, is associated with Karl Popper and whose methodology holds that scientific theories are characterized by being able to provide predictions that future observations might reveal to be false. So a key constituent of a scientific theory in this understanding is its testability. And in order to be testable, any theory must have predictive power. So what then is a demographic theory? Once we've defined demography and said, what well, is a theory? So with demography defined as studying the changing size and structures, the adjective demographic in the strict sense should then only be applied to theories trying to predict aggregate level changes. Having said this, of course, uh, we are aware of the fact that there are multitudes of theories relating to individual behavior at the micro level. All the theories that try to um, explain and predict possibly reproductive behavior resulting in different fertility or individual choices with respect to migration or health related behavior resulting in different mortality patterns that are all components and constituents that matter for demographic change. So they are very important for our understanding the micro foundations, as economists often say, of demographic trends, explaining and predicting the components of demographic change, but only focusing on certain parts of the overall population size and structure. 
So they are not less important, but they are in a way, I call them partial demographic theories because they do not comprehensively sort of look at the outcomes at the macro level. Whenever you talk about theories, you also need to talk about causality. I'm not gonna spend time here. I've explained explain this extensively uh, in the book. Um, in other places I've talked about the social sciences are useful for society at large for two purposes. And that can also sort of uh, distinguish two groups of social sciences and humanities. The one I call identity sciences, they try to understand where do we come from, who are we, this is the historic, historical sciences and so on. And then intervention sciences, this is economics and much of uh, quantitative social science, trying to understand the system and what intervention uh, can make uh, what difference. And in this context, we also define functional causality as a relationship that will hold for the populations and the time horizons under consideration. Now let's then jump to this theory of demographic metabolism. Uh, it, by the name demographic metabolism is more than a half century old uh, coined by Norman. Uh, my, uh, there is the uh, 2013 article entitled Population and Development Review, Demographic Metabolism, a predictive theory of socioeconomic change. So um, I stress in this article again that this is not a theory trying to predict individual behavior, but rather predicting aggregate level change. It is a general theory of how societies change as a consequence of the changing composition of its members with respect to certain relevant and measurable characteristics of people. So these characteristics can either change over the life course of people or from one generation to the next. And when you use the word generation, sociologists will immediately come up with Karl Mannheim, who in 1927 wrote an important paper on the problem of generations. And there he contrasts uh, two opposing views of generation. The one is the, what he calls positivist or biological perspective that we now could safely call demographic. And the other he calls entelechy, it can be translated as the inner spirit of a generation. Uh, so that makes reference to art history as one school of painters uh, replacing the next. Or sometimes people in, in, in business and uh, uh, advertising, they also talk about the different uh, generations like the baby boomers and then the millennials and generation X and so on. So this is a, in a way similar that they have something in common, which is not in a strict sense a demographic cohort. Now, finally, to Norman Ryder, and the work is really based on his uh, most influential article of 1965, the cohort as a concept in the study of social change. Uh, there he introduced the standard demographic definition of a cohort that we teach since then. A cohort may be defined as the aggregate of individuals within some population definition who experience the same event within the same interval. And he coins this notion of demographic metabolism that he defines as the massive process of personnel replacement driven by the birth, lives, and death of individuals. He also makes two interesting statements. The first is uh, quite strong that the societies whose members were immortal would resemble a stagnant pond. He means if there are new generations, uh, if there are no new people coming in, there is complete stagnation, uh, nothing changes. So all the change comes through new young members entering the society. And he also states that metabolism may make changes likely or at least possible, but it does not guarantee that the change is beneficial. So it can go in either direction. Now let's just in a few words summarize, how is this theory uh, that I published in 2013, different from the understanding of Mannheim and Ryder. Uh, this theory of demographic metabolism focuses on heterogeneous generations. People of a given cohort have distinguishable characteristics. They differ by education groups, language, identity, or whatever uh, we'll look at in the moment. And unlike Ryder, this theory does not require complete cohort determinism. Under the demographic multi-state model, people can change over their life course from one state to another. It hence combines aspect of cohort replacement with transitions over the life course. 
Importantly, neither Mannheim nor Ryder, so he was a mathematical demographer, uh, used this uh, sort of for formally forecasting quantitatively or making statements about the future. Now let's give some illustration to this. So what you see here is my favorite illustration. It's the Republic of Korea, which had one of the world's most rapid education expansion. You see an age pyramid where red color gives you the men and women without any education. This was in 1960, yellow primary education, light blue secondary and dark blue tertiary. So you see in 1960, South Korea was a poor developing country with essentially the entire adult population, but in particular the female population above the age of 30, completely uneducated, never had a chance to be in school. But they started already at the young ages uh, to uh, massively invest in education. And you also see fertility was still high, so it really still has a pyramid shape. And we now go in 10 year steps and see demographic metabolism with respect to education alive. In 1970 already, uh, the more educated younger ones are moving up the age pyramid, 1980 now. And this is now also the time when this uh, more educated young people enter the labor force and uh, brought about sort of the uh, economic miracle of the Asian tigers. This is closely associated with these better educated young cohorts moving uh, into their working ages. But still, this is 1990 now, you see the young cohorts are almost completely educated by certain secondary education, but still women above age 50 have very low levels of education because they are still around. And when they were young, uh, they didn't have a chance for schooling. We go on to 2000, 2010, 2020, you see now fertility is very low in Korea. The pyramid is very narrow at the bottom, but Korea now has the best educated population in the young cohorts. More than half of the women in the age group between 20 and 30 have already tertiary education. But still you see some red on the female side in the very high ages. So it's very slow but steady that this demographic uh, metabolism uh, changes, renews society. And uh, here just an overview again in 20 year steps, how the cohorts in each 20 year step get 20 years older. So if you know uh, what's the educational composition after education has been essentially completed, you have a good analytical handle uh, once adjusting for education specific mortality and migration uh, to know what's going to be uh, the uh, educational composition at the higher age groups. Now let's move to a completely other field of application that's deeply into the political sciences, the research on European identity, where we now uh, apply the demographic metabolism uh, to do something that political scientists would never have dared to do, namely uh, forecasting the degree of European identity. This has been published in Science in 2006, as you see here. We used Eurobarometer data uh, with the question, are you feeling yourself mostly as nationality or also have to some degree a European identity? And uh, uh, you see on the right hand side uh, those with multiple identities in the years 96 to 2004 that's the empirical information we had uh, there's quite a range uh, of uh, degrees of european identity not surprisingly the uk is at the very bottom with only 40 percent also feeling partly as europeans and so in that sense the praxis didn't come as a surprise once we plot this by age we see a strong age gradient so the older cohorts, the older age groups are less European minded if you want and have to a much higher degree a national identity. Now this could both be an uh, age effect uh, uh, or, or it could be a cohort effect. And we did some statistical modeling and uh, established it was to a high degree a cohort effect. And therefore we uh, dare to do some projections of European identity up to 2030. And you see for those cohorts that were already in the sample in the around 2004, this is sort of the blue line, the projection based on the demographic metabolism. Uh, for the younger cohorts that were not yet uh, in the sample before, we had to assume a trend extrapolation. So uh, one uh, percentage high of European identity each year. Well, then came the big economic crisis and the Euro crisis and uh, political scientists. Well, well, nice attempt, but it's completely different. European identity has collapsed and uh, the trust in European institutions. Well, in 2013, there was another Eurobarometer survey that asked exactly the same questions. And we had in 2016, a paper in PDR uh, that assessed uh, sort of what our old projections did. And we had 
So you see the, the uh, dark green line is what we modeled, projected for the year 2013, back in 2005. And then the, uh, the broken green line shows you the actually observed new Eurobarometer data. And we see for these cohorts where we, the demographic metabolism model was applied, you see a very nice fit. And we, we actually correctly uh, projected the increasing uh, European identity of the cohorts as they maintain their earlier identity and just move up the age pyramid. Only for the young cohorts, the trend extrapolation uh, did not hold place that there was less of a new recruitment into European identity of the younger cohorts. Okay, let's summarize this uh, demographic metabolism, what is, is useful for. So all populations of human can be meaningfully subdivided into groups where members differ from each other according uh, to measurable characteristics, which also matter for their behavior. Uh, so if the membership in this group is, is stable over the life course after a certain age, such as with ethnicity or native language, higher educational attainment, or the identities as we've just seen, or if we know for certain uh, consistent patterns of transition that can be modeled based on plausible assumption, such as uh, marital status changes or moving into and out of the labor force. Uh, for these cases, the model is really very useful and can give us predictions of a decades into the future. Of course, for other more volatile things, it is less useful. So the multidimensional demographic approach allows us to model how societies change over time as a function of the changing relative sizes of these subgroups. Now, just a few words since time is running on the two other theories, demographic transition. Many people said it's not a theory and I also had doubts because this typical classification is rarely uh, holds. So sometimes the birth rate decline is more rapid or late or sometimes it's together with the death rate decline. We cannot say when is the onset, when, how low it will fall. So uh, many people have criticized that the schematic view that is typically taught as demographic transition theory is not really a theory. So I asked myself, why could we possibly call it a theory? What is sort of the predictive power? And the only thing that was left in a way is the irreversibility. Uh, so I write about the, that the transition to conscious family limitation uh, is indeed irreversible. So once fertility has entered the calculus of conscious choice, as one of the first of the Ansley Cole's famous three preconditions, and family limitation, which is parity specific fertility control, has started to spread to broad segments of the population, then this transition is irreversible and fertility will not go back to an uncontrolled national regime. We do have a test case actually that looked at Moldova, was a former Soviet Republic, had a fertility decline, it's, it's quite well educated, but it's extremely poor now. They, have the, they are the most uh, poorest country in, in Europe now. But um, unlike some people, let's say that the Club of Rome limits to growth assumed, if countries get poor, fertility goes up again. They reacted in the opposite direction. Fertility in Moldova is now only 1.2. The same is true for mortality. I mean, we are now right in the middle of a big mortality crisis. Uh, so, but nobody really expects that we would go back to pre-modern uncontrolled mortality conditions. And because uh, there is this irreversible gain in scientific knowledge about the causes of disease and its treatment, it actually was amazing how rapidly a science could come up with effective vaccinations about against COVID and things like the germ theory of disease has really saved millions of lives, and this is here to stay. So again, it's, it's not numerical predictive power, but a statement about the irreversibility. And finally, the last of the three uh, theories, the demographic dividend. Um, I just cite here this, I've, uh, with a proper theory, I have eight propositions. I spared you the specific propositions, but here for the dividend, I think it can explain the, the quite well what is meant that different members of any population are economically productive to different degrees, depending on their labor force participation and their level of educational skills. So an increase in the proportion of more productive people increases the potential for economic growth. 
uh, that is some predictive power, but still there is the potential. And there's been a, a lot of uh, writing and I, I don't go into this uh, uh, numerical analysis, what is more important at the increasing level of education or just the age structure, which also uh, correlates with uh, labor force participation. Uh, so in a more general sense, as I put it here in blue, an increase in the proportion of more educated people contributing to society and the economy leads on average to increases in human well-being in economic and broader terms. So this is still a rather general and vague statement, but I think it has some predictive power. And we can ask, has it been falsified by any experience? And one country that comes to mind is Cuba, which is quite well educated, but economically is not doing so well due to the uh, political uh, regime. But if you look at other indicators of well-being, it's doing very well. It has higher life expectancy, actually higher than the US even before the COVID pandemic. So in the broader sense, I think there is some predictive power. Now let's in the last few minutes uh, talk about where is this theory of demographic metabolism uh, used uh, by the other scientific uh, uh, community and studies. So one very important field of application is the interactions between uh, population change and climate change. And here is just a chart from our paper in Nature Climate Change, where we see the human population in uh, at least age, sex, and education at time T on the left. Uh, they, we are causing through our consumption, energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, but we are also improving technologies, greener technologies that can help to mitigate global climate change. And then if you look to the adaptation side, sort of how does climate change affect the human population through all these changes that affect our livelihood, that will lead to migration or health and mortality directly. The important thing is here, first of all, we have demographic differential vulnerability. Not everybody is equally vulnerable to these changes. And also at the societal level, uh, the overall uh, human capital or human capabilities, if you want, are changed. So that's why I have here T plus X. So the climate of the future is not gonna meet the population of today nor the public health capabilities of today, but it will meet the population of the future. And if uh, education has improved and the age structure has changed, it will be a significantly different population from today. And we demographers can help to forecast these social changes over time. So I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but there is this shared social economic pathway scenarios that is also called the human core uh, of these, these pathways is essentially demographic scenarios by age, sex, and level of education that are now widely used in the climate change research community. And the, and the new IPCC reports, they cite these SSPs all over the place. So this is really a, quite a prominent um, application. And uh, we also had prominent papers showing here that indeed um, education is a key uh, in driving uh, uh, resilience to future climate change. You see here these red lines in the chart on the red side. Um, and these are different change in climate change hazards uh, combined with rapid uh, social development, whereas the blue lines show you sort of stalled social development that correspond to the population trends. So the blue lines show you higher population growth and, and less education, resulting in many more predicted uh, deaths uh, due to climate change. So relevant for the current uh, discussions in Glasgow is also our conclusions, uh, not just give the money that is green climate fund with a uh, hundred billion dollars per year. That should not all go to the engineering projects, but also investments in the social side and particularly education. Now, a last uh, uh, point uh, before I end here for aging in, uh, in the European context, we recently had a paper in PNAS that uh, has uh, the population by age, sex, labor force participation, and education. You see these multicolor pyramids for Italy, for instance, on the right. Here you see the red color is uh, those who are inactive or not in the labor force, and the green, those who work. And then the uh, shading gives you the degree of education. So the dark green ones are the better educated. So you see, if you look from Paris to Sweden, you see that the Swedish population is in a much higher degree involved in the labor market and also much better educated. For Italy, you see an interesting phenomenon that the younger cohorts of women are much more 
participating in the labor force than the older cohorts. And this is indeed also a cohort effect that we can uh, also uh, project into the future using the demographic metabolism model. And this shows us uh, with three different dependency ratio as calculated for the EU28 here in this paper. The green shows you the conventional age dependency ratio where you simply take the population um, yeah, below 20 and above 65 in relation to the working age population. And here you see this massive increase by 60% uh, that scares everybody. And then in red, you see the much more optimistic and actually more realistic labor force dependency ratio because it shows the proportion of people who are uh, not in the labor force to those who are in the labor force. And that's really matters much more than the age structure because what matters is the real labor force participation. And here you only see an increase by a little over 20%. And finally, if you also take the education improvements with cohorts into account, uh, this productivity weighted dependency ratio only increases by about 10%. And if we then factor in, as we do some further migration scenarios of more educated migration into Europe, you actually come to see a decline in the total dependency uh, over the coming decades in Europe. So in conclusion, under a multidimensional demographic perspective, the future looks very different. So it's not just a little adjustment, uh, it's a fundamentally different narrative, a different story that we get for the future once we apply this multidimensional uh, demographic theory. So in conclusion, I just want to quickly cite uh, a couple of famous demographers about this, the role of theory in our work. There was a book on the state of population theory by Roger Scopus and David Coleman in 1986, where they wrote in the introduction, any subject which finds it necessary or indeed possible to consider its material divorced from an appropriate body of theory must be in trouble. Uh, well, we can discuss whether this is still the case today or whether we indeed we are in trouble. And then about the same time, Nathan Kiefitz wrote, demography far from being imperialistic, has withdrawn even from its own frontiers and left a no man's land which other disciplines have infiltrated. Economists have turned their attention to marriage and the family and he goes on saying how other disciplines have really took over the analysis of demographic um, phenomena because we are too shy to come up with our own uh, good theories in this field. Well, there's enough to be discussed. My own view is that actually we, don't need to uh, be shy. We have a very powerful core, genuinely demographic toolbox that actually can do better quantitative uh, projections, forecasts, predictions, if you want, uh, for decades into the future than any other social science. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang, for your, your introduction. and covering a lot of ground uh, as usual and your call to action. Um, I think it's uh, food for thought and, and for discussion. Opening the discussion today, we have a group of, uh, of excellent colleagues uh, from all over the world uh, that will open the discussion as our, our panelists. So it's a very impressive lineup should just me uh, just remind you. So we have Alicia Azera, who is a senior research scholar and lecturer at the Prince's School of Public and International Affairs in Princeton. We have Francesco Billeri, Professor of Demography and Dean of the Faculty of Bocconi University, and of course, Honorary President of the European Association for Population Studies. Joshua Goldstein, Director of the Berkeley Population Center and Professor of Demography in Berkeley. Luan Yang, from Founding Director and Professor of the Asian Demographic Research Institute from Shanghai University and Associate of the Population Council. And last but definitely not least, Landy uh, uh, Sanchez Pena, the chair of the Center for Demographic, Urban and Environmental Studies of El Colegio de Mexico. So, Andreas, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really a very inspiring talk. Thanks, Wolfgang. Um, perhaps my, my first question is um, um, theories are usually um, aiming to ex explain a system like, like population dynamics. Uh, they, they provide a focus how to look at reality, such as population change. But with such, such a theoretical focus, isn't there also a risk to, to overlook factors uh, and processes that fall outside of that theoretical focus? So 
which could add a different perspective and, and, and be innovative. So is, is this a risk? Uh, so how does the theoretical lens and perspective relate to innovation? What is your view on that? Alicia, may you go first? Okay, thank you for inviting me to discuss uh, Wolfgang's book. I really enjoy uh, having the opportunity to look at it. I don't know if it's already out there, but you know, I recommend everybody to look at it. I just want to call attention to a sentence from his introduction that I think summarizes a bit what Wolfgang uh, has shown us and has done. He says in the introduction, uh, demographers should not only focus on the head count, but also consider what is inside the heads. And I think that sentence is lovely. It's really reflecting what the optimistic Wolfgang that we all know. I mean, I consider him somebody who thinks very highly about human ingenuity. And we have seen that here. I mean, the way he really highlights human capital and education and labor force participation are big drivers. So I think this is a, a big contribution of, of his work, especially in pushing the multidimensional perspective and introducing all these other human capital dimensions that were not there when we were thinking about our age pyramids traditionally, and also the implications they have in aggregate, you know, with all this uh, demographic metabolism theory that he has just uh, synthesized here. Uh, so my question is more uh, related, I guess, to the theory, or what does it mean theory? And, uh, I guess I'm coming from economic demography, which is one of the subfields that um, Wolfgang is saying it may be impartial into what is the, the analysis of demography. So what he says is basically we need some discussion about the need of theoretical frameworks that are demographic and that have some predictive power and are well structured. And he dismisses people who say, well, demography doesn't have a theory. And also people who say a life table is a theory. And I, you know, I am with him on that. But my question is, how do we go to the next step? And he puts very nicely these three theories he highlights, the demographic metabolism, demographic transition, and demographic dividend as examples of how, in fact, the changing composition of the demos just uh, evolves and affects the, the outdoors, outcomes of our um, population. So my question is more, you know, this demos is an aggregate. And you argue that the theories of individual behavior provide information, but are only informative. They do not, are not really complete. And there's something else with demography can offer. But to me, when I think about the demos, I'm not thinking the demos doesn't have really a behavioral theory behind the demos. How do we think about the demos as an entity uh, in terms of behavioral prediction? Uh, and so in, the, in that, I think about the microeconomics, microeconomics tension that somehow has become reconciled by the micro foundations of macroeconomics and bringing somehow the individual behavior into explaining the demos, in this case, the whole economy. And so my question will be, you know, I understand how changing composition can affect uh, social transformation. We can have peer effects if we think about the Princeton Fertility Project already showing peer effects in expanding that initial demographic transition by just having people, you know, uh, learning from others, for example. And I think that's a little bit what you have in mind when you're thinking about uh, this uh, demographic metabolism or about externalities, about changing incentives when we have different equilibriums in how many people are there educated or not and affecting the incentives to enter the labor force or uh, what is the impact on earnings, so on and so forth. So with all this discourse, basically what I'm coming up is, okay, you're saying Individual uh, behavior. If I can, if I, if I can, if I, if I can interrupt you, Alicia. Sorry. If I can interrupt you, I think your question was already very, very clear. So maybe also. In I'm going to the, the question now: Is how do I train a demographer? That's my question. <laughs> so with this right. in mind, if I want to think about this here, what's the, how do I train the demographer? Good. Would someone else like to take the floor from the panel? A follow up uh, on Alicia's point. Uh, um, thanks, Wolfgang. This is very important work. Uh, let me start from Guillaume Wunsch, who was uh, my predecessor, president of the IPS. He wrote once a, a paper called God has chosen to give the easy problems to the physicists or why demographers need theory. So I think, Wolfgang, you are uh, limiting too much the idea of what is a demographic theory by thinking that only macro-level theories are demographic theories. 
So I'm basically echoing Alicia's point. I think we need, we need a behavioral foundation for demographic behavior. We need a behavioral foundation for demographic metabolism. We need a behavioral foundation for demographic transition. And this behavioral foundation is a macro, micro, macro prediction. And I think you, you gave it uh, in a nice way. I mean, you referred to the Coleman boat. Uh, so I'm not sure we should give away the idea that micro-founding demography is a partial theory. I would rather say the opposite, that only macro-founding demography is a partial theory. So I think uh, I, would, I would rather have a, an expansive view, an inclusive view of what are demographic theories. Demographic theories are theories about... Uh, uh, the size, uh, structure, and composition of population that are also supported by theories about uh, uh, the behavior of individuals. So I think this, this is something uh, I will um, basically challenge you on, not only macro, micro-found demography. Thank you. Could, could, I, could I just ask Francesco, what would be a, a reason we would need a micro-foundation uh, in order to could you just give us an example? So the micro foundation, the, the, I mean, the easy example of micro foundation is in the demographic transition, why will fertility decrease uh, when mortality decreases? Because, uh, I mean, this was already said by demographers because uh, maybe we have a target of uh, a number of uh, children reaching a certain age and if mortality declines, then we decrease fertility with conscious choice, as Ansley Cole was saying. So this is just one example. But in this case, it's a partial theory. And I agree, it's only partial in, in the Vulcan sense. Landy, would you like to come in? Please unmute yeah. yourself. Well, I have um, just a comment on what has been discussed now, and is the issue about context, or whether to say if we also need um, uh, a, a theory about the role of institutions, for example, right? It will be something like a meso, uh, a bridge in order to understand the mechanisms uh, behind uh, the change and uh, demographic change. Uh, and just give me, uh, let me give an, an example. For example, Luz, uh make a very good point about how education actually is increasing uh, a female level for participation in some of the countries that he shows in the book. But for example, in some Latin American countries that is not happening. Mexico is one of those examples where the level of participation can, uh, for females have stagnated in the last decade. And that may be related precisely to the uh, a, institution, formal and informal institutions related to how female have, for example, uh, access to care and, uh, and also the gender norms in each of the countries. So uh, for one of that, I will, I will, and education has increased. So what is the role of context in, in the sense of what are the roles of institution in each of the countries in order to uh, shift and, and, and uh, transform the, the, this demographic transition that he's talking about and the demographic metabolism into actual uh, changes in behavior and also actual changes at the level of the aggregate. And I have another question later. Good, before maybe we go on to uh, another panelist, maybe uh, just a quick question from the floor from Jakub Bijak, just to... Uh, there is the school of thought that explanatory theories, the how and the why, especially behavior related theories, should be equally important for demographers because he starts, why should theories have only to be predictive though? And he says, see, for example, Tom Birch's uh, book on the model based demography. I think this is uh, what we are all discussing now as well. Okay, so maybe Luan now, would you like to come in? Yes, I see your hand. Actually, um, I want to comment on, and uh, I'm sorry that uh, my internet connection is not stable, so I didn't turn on my uh, video. And I think, uh, um, to some extent, I agree that um, scientific um, demography as a scientific subject has uh, uh, the power um, for uh, predict the changes in the future and have the predictive power. 
Um, on the other, other hand, as a scientific subject, you, own, you also have um, the capacity and the strength to describe some changes, not necessarily predict, but to describe some phenomena, some events, and also explain the change, the mechanism of the changes. And uh, of course, the predictive uh, uh, power is important, but um, the, the, the strength to explain the, um, the, uh, the historic change and also understand the, the mechanism of the changes um, as important. And demography, um, um, the multi-dimensional model, and you know, as um, Wolfgang ever used right, to understand how um, education uh, improved over time and what the relationship uh, with the edu education relate to economic growth. And we also use multi-dimensional model to understand uh, how um, urban um, change, how um, urban growth uh, driven by demographic phenomena, so by, by uh, birth and death uh, and the migration across urban, those are, and also their relationship with um, social economic development, environment uh, changes. So those are the things like, um, I think demography as a some scientific subject has um, the cap capability um, to develop a theory to understand uh, the relationship. Maybe Wolfgang, you would like to give a first reaction on those? Well, yes, thank you very much. These are uh, very important issues. And uh, I think I try to be careful, certainly not to downplay the issue of the, the micro foundations of demographic trends, which is, of course, that is, uh, I would say the majority of the research work that all we are doing. And also in the chapter three of the book, that's exactly, I look at the, the determinants of fertility and mortality and introduce this notion also of cognition driven demographic transition, uh, precisely because we, we need for, for assessing the macro level changes, we need research uh, on the uh, behavioral theories uh, uh, behind uh, that in the end result uh, in combination of fertility, mortality, migration and education, all these individual level decisions are combined uh, to then a population size and structural changes. So my point was more of a, a almost linguistic or notional because uh, starting from the demos, uh, the ancient Greek demos, as opposed to the idiotes, the individual, like we could also have ideographic theories that uh, sort of then look at the life cycle. And there's so much work and actually I would say 90% of the dissertations that are being produced in demography are focusing on these individual life cycle uh, uh, studies and uh, I don't want to downplay it, but when we then, what I say, sort of demography proper in the original meaning of the changing size and structures of the population and how that matters for the rest of the world, that's when I could only identify uh, these three that I, I chose to highlight here. But uh, of course, there are, as I said, so many other components uh, um, playing together. And as uh, this uh, uh, Coleman ship really sees, we have a constant back and forth between uh, causation. There's also some causation on the uh, on some intervention at the aggregate level, like in economics, if the central bank sets the interest rate. And so this is something uh, that in itself sort of uh, intervenes at the macro level. But I, we don't have to go into this uh, in more detail. The, um, yeah, the, the other question about uh, sort of model and, and theory. So what we clearly don't want, and many in the qualitative uh, social science in particular, they often call a theory what in my view is a simple classification. They just uh, define different categories of things and then talk about uh, this being a theory. Um, a theory must have uh, some uh, predictive power and that's where I subscribe to uh, Karl Popper. Actually, uh, by the way, I had the opportunity at once when I was visiting London with the uh, World Fertility Survey working there. I, I had an opportunity of a visit because I brought him some his favorite dish, which was some Viennese Erdäpfel Goulash. And so he felt obliged to talk for half an hour with me about a theory of science and demography. And, and there also was the question of sort of what's the difference between a model and a theory? Yes, a model is a very important tool, um, but the, the model itself is, does not yet have predictive power. It comes with additional premises, additional assertions that say this model can be uh, used and it will actually tell us what the future will bring under these uh, conditions. And that is my statement about 
uh, these conditions. But the model is clearly an important step uh, towards the theory. And actually, there's almost no uh, quantitative theory without the model uh, that is much better than just a mere classification. Uh, but on the other side, a model like I look at the linear regression model, I think nobody would claim uh, that this is a, has predictive power, although it is a very useful tool for understanding what's going on. If I may say, can, can we have a quick take of the panel on, on, on what what's, uh, Wolfgang is, is, is stating that demographic theories are a way of repositioning our discipline in the, the core of social science. Can, can, can we have a quick round of what, what, what your views are on that? Maybe uh, start with, uh, with Landy? Sure. Um, I will say two things. One is that I totally agree with Wolfgang that, that uh, theories are necessary in our field um, in order to um, move forward the disciplines, uh, particularly to kind of regain what is the identity of the uh, demographic studies. And I, one of the points that I like the most about the book is um, that there is no tension between theory and I would say applications. Because I think that's something that char characterized Wolfram works and is present in the book in the sense that there is a very clear uh, push for uh, be present in the public agenda, right? To develop tools and develop uh, uh, kind of uh, materials that actually speak to the public agenda in very important matters, such as development goals or climate change. And I think what the, the book makes a very nice point about that we need to um, uh, position ourselves from a very demographic uh, approach to those goals. And we need to uh, present an argument about what, uh, what is demographic in those, in those goals and identify what is precisely what the discipline is, uh, is bringing to that field. And that by repositioning what is uh, that demographic approach, we are gonna gain a track into those public uh, arguments. And, and that uh, we can show that in fact, the, what is the power of our discipline in terms of uh, moving forward that discussion. But we shouldn't be afraid that, uh, of using theories or demographic theories, so to speak, in order to engage with public agenda. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, one of the strengths of the disciplines, right? The ability to manage theories and also application. And I think that's something that is being shown very nicely in the book. Francesca, would you like to come, uh, come in the discussion? Thank you. I, I agree with the positioning idea of Wolfgang. I think it is very important. Uh, and still, I see the issue that Alicia has brought earlier. So the issue of training the next generation of uh, demography experts. And I'm afraid here one has to be a bit pragmatic because most uh, of the next generation of demographers will not be trained as demographers, but they will be tra trained as demographers and. And I think in that sense, the, the, the book of Vulcan is, is very important because it makes a connection with uh, other disciplines, mostly uh, at the macro level, but it is a, a central issue in terms of repositioning in social sciences. I also uh, agree with that. Josh. Uh, maybe I'll switch gears a little bit um, and just talk about the macro level and why um, maybe uh, an outsider or an American might be skeptical of the fact that demography might be destiny and that uh, if we know what cohort somebody's in, we'll know their behavior. Uh, Wolfgang already alluded to it uh, when he mentioned politics and voting, um, where we have people switching, you know, People switching their votes, even though the you know all, all the demographic determinism turned out to be wrong. So what what did you know? It, I think Wolfgang would would agree that this is probably not a great application for this theory. But maybe by examining what went wrong, we can understand the limits of the theory. And and basically, what goes wrong is that there's not a strong cohort effect. And there's not a, a strong age effect. There's lots of very strong period interactions with everything, and uh, you know the white working class has changed its voting, and the the uh, the, uh, the the less educated people have changed their voting, and uh, 
essentially the things that we thought held constant didn't turn out to be constant. And so these books, uh, for example, predicting the, the demographic majority in the US as a result of demographic change were, were, were turned out to be uh, quite wrong. So I guess I would just uh, use that as an example to, to uh, emphasize Wolfgang's concluding point, which was that uh, uh, these, these kind of cohort age projections are wonderful when we identified the right states and when we think they're not gonna change and, and we think they're fairly invariant and identifying the applications like the very clever ones he showed us uh, is really the art here. It's not a general method that will work for any kind of population characteristic uh, or any type of behavior. Uh, really, I think the magic is identifying things that are going to be fairly predictable and, uh, and, and fairly uh, invariant. Um, let me just- Maybe, maybe keep it short, uh, Josh. Sure. Uh, the, um, you know, why, why, are, why is demography not more about cohorts? And this is my last kind of pitch here. And that is that uh, somehow surprises <laughs> And period surprises are what seems to get people's attention. And uh, I think Wolfgang's doing us a major service by, service by pointing out that what we can predict and what's somehow not a surprise is really our major con contribution. And he's of course forecasting things 50, 60 years out. So we may be surprised uh, at what we see, but uh, just because it's not surprising doesn't mean it's not valuable. So I think Leib, you raised your hand if I saw it correctly. Maybe you would like, also like to, to give a comment. Yeah, I'll make a very short um, two points. Um, first, I think this is the uh, right timing um, to, um, the book um, appears in uh, a good timing. I think um, particularly, um, and we have uh, um, the major changes in, um, in, in the world. And uh, um, it, it's very interesting to know that uh, there is an increase in demography in um, German speaking uh, world and, and in the Asian, in Eastern uh, um, Asia, that you see the, 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 the some decline in, in population studies because of uh, the, the original uh, focus on, on fertility uh, decline. Now you have a very low fertility and uh, uh, in the past, the uh, population uh, demography was uh, in general is, uh, is the same uh, as the population studies. And uh, when you talk about uh, demography, and they will say just like, oh, you, you work, particularly in China, you're, you're working on family planning. Now, if you have a low fertility and that uh, kind of a reason for uh, support um, demography um, seems not there, I think uh, Wolfgang's book has come right on time and to um, to define uh, the scientific subject of the necessity of uh, have, uh, um, demography um, in, in the core of uh, um, social sciences. And that's, that's a short point and um, one make. And the other thing I, I want to mention that um, we, although we, we do um, work on, um, look at the population as groups, and we also uh, can, we can use different ways uh, to do that, um, to make that happen, right? We can use, uh, um, take advantage of uh, um, data science advancement. We have these uh, micro simulation models, although we simulate um, um, the, the evolution um, of individual people, but we can come up with a group, uh, the description of uh, the group uh, status. And that's not, I, I don't, see the um, sharp division between micro and, and, and the micro. So I think, um, yeah, that's something like we, we can work on in the same time, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Wolfgang, would you like to conclude and give us some take home messages? Well, thank you very much for this most stimulating discussion. Unfortunately, the time is, is really limited here. And um, I just, uh, the last substantive point is, is referring to what Josh just said. I mean, the political scientists uh, have a tendency to see everything as just a period effects, uh, changing uh, through to changing external conditions. And with this paper on European identity, uh, we really sort of took most of them by surprise. This is a paradigm that is just not on their mind, where really demography can uh, make a big impact on political science by pointing at this cohort change. 
And also, I don't know the US data uh, with respect to switching party preference, but um, at least in Europe, I've also seen cohort specific studies where there is some degree of constancy. It's the, the younger cohorts who have a different probability of switching over to another party than the older ones. But even if there's change over the life cycle, of course, this can also be modeled in terms of the transition rate switching from one party to another. So there is a rich field of publication where our uh, demographic paradigms really have to contribute something also to other social science disciplines that we are not yet doing enough. I think there's a huge opportunity to bring our specific strengths into a broad, smaller range of uh, scientific disciplines. Uh, that is sort of on the making uh, repositioning of demography and and then on the theory uh, i think in the international population community we need to pay a little more attention uh, to theoretical issues as far as i remember in the past i used to speak conferences or paa or european conference whatever so ever i hardly ever found a session on demographic theories maybe we should uh, probably because you didn't expect any papers uh, to be submitted there uh, but maybe we have to start, if there's a session, there may be papers, if there are more papers, there may be more sessions, because this is really uh, very closely associated, and this brings me to the statement by uh, David Coleman and Roger Schofield, that it's our identity. Every discipline has a, an identity, and that is closely associated with a theoretical base on which we base our, our research further on. So with this, I think I conclude and thank you so much to, to all the participants around the globe and to the organizers and in particular also to the panelists for your most helpful feedback and comments. And I think we should definitely continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.